What's up, everybody? Welcome to Gojo with Mike Golick Jr. That is me. With me, as always, super producer Brandon Newman. Brandon, how we feeling? Doing great, Mike. It's a uh, holiday Monday. It is a holiday Monday. Uh, happy 4th of July week. It's weird because 4th of July is falling in the middle of the week this year, so everyone's firing yeah. off fireworks on the 1st and 2nd, which... I get oh. because it's the weekend, but Brandon, I'm sure as someone with young kids and ours as a family with dogs, 4th of July, always very different calculus when you're not actively celebrating. Like I've been a part of the fireworks crews. I've gone off when we lived in Connecticut, we used to illegally import. I think the statute of limitations is probably good. We used to get a bunch of yeah. illegal fireworks and fire them off and put a show on for our neighborhood. And then now later on realizing, oh, this just triggers a lot of people's dogs and people that are dealing with things. So not always the most fun, but Still really hard to not enjoy when you're firing off yourself. Yeah, as an adult, as a parent now, I realize certain holidays are past bedtime. You mm. know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, Halloween kind of backs up into that. And then Fourth of July is definitely one of those that's just simply past bedtime. And I guess it's the summertime, so you're not really supposed to care. But I did have to move my dog far, far away from my children's room last night as everyone is testing out their fireworks up until 11 p.m. on most days. I guess that's my thing, uh, uh, you know, in general. I don't want to deprive people of their fun because I've had that same fun. And so if we all picked a day around 4th of July, like if this year it was going to be Saturday because it's the 4th of July weekend, people aren't going to necessarily go off like that during the week the same way. That's cool, but it's the four or five days around the holiday where people just feel like firing off fireworks at random times when people aren't ready for it. That's probably the one where I'm like, maybe we need to reel this behavior back in because people do have dogs and people that respond poorly to the situation yeah and I, i'll be a negative nancy here my dad does it to me every year he sends out the text message my dad worked with veterans so the ptsd of it all yep. is very real mike alluded to it earlier so yes it's not all uh rainbows and sunshine and fireworks when there's fireworks nope so be mindful but obviously hope everyone enjoys all their time you got a three-day weekend out of it more than likely so that's cool appreciate that spend time with your family do all that fun stuff um we got a great show for you guys today as always make sure you download subscribe rate review leave us that five star rating check us out on the DraftKings YouTube channel, as well as DraftKingsNetwork.com, where you can see us live Monday through Friday, 10 to 11 a.m. Eastern, normally most days, and we'll get to all the NBA free agency. Uh, despite Twitter's best efforts, we were able to get a bunch of really interesting information <laughs> about NBA free agency, including, Brandon, the one thing that we have been waiting for for years. The damn thing finally happened. The Woj bomb Ooh. to end all Woj bombs, and so we will get to everything with Damian Lillard and some winners and losers from that Um We'll also get to a little bit of lacrosse played over the weekend. I'm very excited about. We're actually going to do weekend roses. I feel like it's been a while. We've had some weird scheduling yeah. things that have netted us that. But uh, full disclosure, we are recording on Sunday. So there might be some things that we miss Sunday afternoon for the Monday show here. Um, unfortunately, this past week, at the end of the week, uh, we lost my grandmother, my, my, my dad's mother, my father's mother, which is why... Dad wasn't with us Friday towards the end of the show or Friday for the show won't be with us today. And so we've got the funeral and services going on Monday that we'll get to with that. And Brandon, obviously, you know, it's sad, but also a celebration of life. My grandma, my grandma Kate was 92 years old when she passed. And up until last summer was still driving, could do everything, was at my sister's wedding, throwing down on the dance floor. So she lived an unbelievable life and I am Sad that she is obviously no longer here with us, you know, uh, on this earth, but am excited to celebrate what was an incredible life that netted, you know, a great family, so many of the people I love that she was the matriarch of. So uh, it, it's sad. I, I feel for my dad who's not here, obviously, and, and, you know, what this is like in losing a parent for him, but... I, I yeah. know and understand that all of us, and my dad would echo the same thing and has, we'd all sign up for 92 right now, no questions asked, and especially with that quality of life. And so I, I really do Amen. think it is a chance to look back and celebrate what, what my grandma Kate meant to all of us and what this person meant to so many people. And it's such illuminating to see what your grandmother meant to the other people that you'll be able to yeah. meet at, at the funeral as well. Um, it's always tough losing a, a staple, a figurehead in your family, uh, especially a mother, especially a grandmother um, for any family. And your family is so special for the foundation that she lay it, uh, laid down with your grandfather. And we all benefit from it, Mike. So um, obviously we all send our condolences to you. We thank you for 
you know, all that you do and your dedication to this and us. But um, uh, we all know the family comes first. Yeah, I, I will say it is it is a chance to kind of remember back because they lived in on a lot of memories. Like they lived in the same house. My grandma still is the same house that my dad and all his brothers grew up in. And it's not a big house. So imagine my dad, nine-year NFL player, my uncle Bob, 14-year NFL player, my uncle Greg, six-foot-eight college offensive lineman, all growing up in this house and the stories that are in there. But, uh, you know, with, like you said, a, a grandmother figure and that sort of matriarch figure, you kind of always want to keep them happy, right? You're usually only as happy as the head of the house is. And I remember I'm such a people pleaser. One of my core memories with my grandmother is we were all over there. We usually went out there for Easter. I have two. One is she one year made pineapple upside down cake that I really didn't like. Just wasn't my cup of tea for whatever reason. It's the one dessert. And I force fed myself the one piece and went back up for seconds with everyone in my family knowing I did not like it, but wanting to make sure that my grandma Kate felt like she had done a good job and that she had provided us (laughs) with the right dessert. And so that's maybe more of an indictment of me than of her. But Brandon, the story that I feel like is seared into my brain forever and unfortunately embarrassed my grandmother in front of her whole neighborhood was one Easter out there when I was in college I was finally at that point where I was feeling froggy and stepping towards my dad a little bit and thinking I could you know take him because I was a big strong college sophomore junior and he was in his 50s with a bunch of surgeries and my dad said all right we'll go out my dad former college wrestler said we'll go out in the front lawn and if I can get up off the ground starting from that like base bottom uh wrestling position there, I win, and if I can't, you uh, you win. And we went out in our Easter Sunday clothes, polos, jeans, all that, on the front lawn of their house in Ohio and wrestled on the front lawn in front of the entire neighborhood on Easter Sunday. So I don't know if I made my grandmother proud in either instance, but I know we all tried, and I know these are a lot of the stories that we're going to be trading in over the next couple of days here as we celebrate her life. So it's uh, hey, that it's territory she's used to. She had all boys. Man, you're not kidding. Uh, uh, God truly gave his toughest battle to her, uh, his strongest soldier, and she absolutely nailed it. So um, we'll we'll, we'll keep everyone posted on that. I'm sure, you know, Dad will have something to say when he gets back here, but that is uh, why scheduling-wise we are where we are here. Um, But uh, Brandon will do the no easy transition version of these conversations and uh, get to the thing that happened to everyone over the weekend – which is Elon Musk decided we all needed to go outside. And those aren't my words. Those are actually his words as he tries to justify Twitter going absolutely bonkers over the weekend as NBA free agency gets going, Brandon. Like, obviously, not everybody in the world is on Twitter. This is for all of us who are terminally online in so many ways. But yes. On the weekend of NBA free agency, it did feel particularly appropriate that whether it's because Twitter did not pay their bills to the Google Cloud storage services, whether it's data scraping, whatever the hell that is that Elon wants to use to justify it, over the weekend, Elon Musk managed to do what for so long the settings on my phone could not, which is limit my screen time on that app, by imposing... For Twitter Blue users, a 6,000 tweet limit to, to read every day. For yep. non-Twitter Blue users, a users a 600 tweet limit per day. And then even lower for that for people that had just made accounts. Brandon, I saw a lot of people complaining. I feel like for a lot of us that have been a little too online for a little too long, I almost breathed a sigh of relief. Cause it's like, oh, okay, I have to go away from this now. This is a huge win. I, I for the first time in my life, I almost thanked Elon Musk. That that's funny you said that, Mike, because I'm over here thinking I'm over here putting war paint on. I was like, okay, now companies everywhere are gonna be fighting tooth and nail to be one of those six hundred tweets a day for people. I know it does make you think of the economy of tweets now. And I understand I'm like a lot of other people. I've made part of my living through Twitter. I've certainly, it's a great walking resume for those of us in the industry. It's a great networking tool. I've met people around the industry because of this app. I'm not discounting the importance of it to my career. It's certainly been there. And so yes, make sure you make uh, the tweet where I post this podcast, one of the 600 tweets you get every day or whatever he's raised it to. Now (laughs) I feel like with the moral of the story is Twitter is never going to be 
static with Elon Musk at the helm. It's going to be this ever-changing blob of weird, yes. inconsistent changes and likely mistakes. But there was part of me, I cannot lie, that was like, okay, set the phone down. I get to go do anything else right now. And I know I could have done that before, but with the infinite possibility of that app in front of me, I was not strong enough to do. And so now I have been given <laughs> that freedom, that liberation from my bird map master. Uh, Elon Musk is good friends with Bob Iger, uh, the creator of Flubber from Disney, and Twitter's like Flubber. It is ever-changing, uh, Morpheus of things. Mike, uh, you alluded to it real quick. Uh, that was Elon Musk's parody who said he set the limit for it so everyone can go outside. Oh, and, okay. Uh, he did a good deed here. So like, I got got by the internet yet again. I, I guess, and not surprising, the internet that Elon Musk created where anybody could get a blue check mark and impersonate anybody else, and it usually works out. And before he was banning people that impersonated him, now he's retweeting people that impersonated him. So I don't know what yes. the hell is going on. Again, because try when when it's just boiled down to one person's whims and not a company, all bets are truly off. So good luck out here. I'll see some of you over on Blue Sky later on, and we'll keep this thing moving. <laughs> Brandon jokes about um, Blue Sky aside, and for anyone that hasn't seen, I guess some of the old Twitter founders have created a new social media app called Blue Sky that some people, myself included, have migrated over to just to see what's going what? on. And Brandon, it's so interesting because you and I got Twitter when we were in college. And at that point, yeah. you had had Facebook, you had had MySpace, but our understanding of social media in this way, the way that Twitter would end up becoming in a community was so different. It was before separate profiles that people would visit to. Twitter became the place we would actually go hang out. So it was more of a place you yeah. lived than a place you visited. And so we didn't really know what we were walking into back then. It was kind of like being born where you don't know you're becoming a person as a kid. <laughs> you just kind of go on through it. What I would equate walking into the feeling of this, walking into a new social media is what you see in the post-apocalyptic movies where you know what society is supposed to look like and you're walking into a blank space in the aftermath of something that's gone on and you're trying to figure out where you fit in, knowing you're going to end up basically remaking like in every apocalypse movie they think they're going to remake society better you just end up doing the same thing and we're likely going to do right. that here but we're still in the space where people are walking in and testing the surroundings and haven't figured out what do i do here am i the guy that supplies ammunition am i the guy that supplies fuel am i going out on water runs what is it and so uh, blue sky to me feels like post-apocalyptic twitter Mike, I am terrified of most things post-apocalyptic that's why i like watching them but um the thought of getting into a new social media right now is just so terrifying. Like I haven't even kicked the tires really on TikTok yet uh, enough to, to, and that one's doing very well right now. I retweeted somebody who said, this is me uh, getting ready on, for TikTok when Twitter dies. And I'm just sadly doing the dances, crying that little boy meme. <laughs> like this is where I'm at right now. So to, to venture off into the blue sky without a parachute, I don't know. Blue Sky does also feel like millennials trying to continue to carve out a place for us online because TikTok <laughs> is very much Gen Z space. You need only look at right. the videos they've made for Grimace's birthday over there, dousing themselves in purple McDonald's milkshake. <laughs> Those kids are on something different. The wavelength they've got just doesn't hit with ours. So I wish them well. I will visit every once in a while, but we can't live there. That is not our neighborhood. And so no. we'll see. I, I, you know, I'm going to be on Twitter till the very end, but Brandon, and uh, let's get from all of this nonsense to the NBA free agency from over the weekend getting started. A lot of deals getting yes. announced. And that means it's time for winners and losers. Whether or not you think that's something that can even apply at this point. I don't care because I think there's clearly some people that have won and lost over the weekend. And Brandon, we want to start in a positive note here. So why don't we look at some NBA free agent winners? I want to hit you with some ideas that I had. You can tell me if I've missed anything here. Because I think there are some that are very clear. Like this one, very near and dear to your and my heart. Big winner from over the weekend, football shoulders. 
Yes. Shout out to Desmond Bain getting the five-year, $207 million <clears throat> max extension with the Memphis Grizzlies. He becomes the first Grizzlies player to receive a $200 million contract in that franchise's history. And Brandon, he has done that, shooting above 40% from three, I believe, for the last three seasons, something in that range, yeah. and doing it with shoulders that belong on a football player. If you have ever watched Desmond Bain, you look out and see a guy who has that sort of turtle shell that you see. I always say, Brandon, when you run into a former athlete from a contact sport, like a physical sport, football, rugby, UFC, there's an area in the yoke up on the shoulders where if you cut into mm -hmm. it, it would be like looking at the rings on a tree. And you'd be able to see all of the years they put into building that yoke. And it's the last thing to go. It's why I noticed from my dad from behind, even as he lost all the weight, you can still tell that he played ball back in the day because there's remnants yeah. of the yoke. Desmond Bain has the yoke that is uncommon amongst basketball players. It's like Ben Wallace, Dwight Howard, and Desmond Bain that walk into this party. Ooh. Actually, shout out to Giannis Antetokounmpo also. Incredible set of shoulders there. But True, you get what obviously. I'm saying. These are uncommon. And the fact that he's been able to shoot this well, be that consistent for this team, and now achieve max contract status, whether or not some people think he deserve it, Brandon is a win for those of us in the football community because he is somewhat of us. <laughs> he is, Mike. I mean, he looks like a football player at 6'5". You know what I mean? Like, most that's usually lineman territory but or defensive end. But he... He's an optical illusion. It's like looking at a funhouse mirror, Mike. But he's also is just very, very effective shooting the basketball. One of the best. Like for him to get this money without having a, a you know all star under his belt already is what everyone's kind of looking at. But with Ja being up and down, building around Desmond Bain and Memphis Grizzlies right now, who just got Marcus Smart and Derrick Rose, like they are gearing up to. Uh, become a very a much more mature basketball team in Memphis by the time Ja comes back from those suspensions. Yeah, I did love the idea that Derrick Rose was like purely a leadership signing at this point. And the thing oh that gosh. people use as the example was they went back to, it must have been like the 2012 NBA All-Star game when LeBron and all those guys came out singing and dancing to the song that was playing. And then you looked at Derrick yeah. Rose, refused to move his arms from behind his back, <laughs> refused to wipe the scowl <laughs> off his face. And they're like, that's the guy that's going to write the ship around here in memphis so congratulations yeah. i mean to he is yeah. go ahead I, th I think there there has to be a little bit of fear to leadership and especially at the guard position so they like went and got the most like thorough like bully like he like reminds me of somebody who should be on the scared straight program oh man <laughs> derrick rose nba beyond scared straight is the in-season series i would absolutely watch people that are looking to draft off the success of things like hard knocks you've got to try and find other reality paradigms to bring into the mm. fold that might be a great version of that and uh <laughs> all right brandon outside of desmond bain's large shoulders um other winners as we look at nba free agency houston strip clubs you may not have gotten James Harden. It appears that ship has sailed after some decisions Houston ultimately made about the direction of their team, which is why James Harden opted into his deal with Philly and is exploring trades there. But if you are Houston, there was a tremendous amount of money handed out. Shout out to Fred Van Fleet. In all seriousness, three years, $130 million. The story with him, well told. Former undrafted free agent, ends up becoming an NBA champion, ends up becoming an all-star, and now gets a three-year max contract, which is an incredible story for him. But between that, Brandon... And then Dylan Brooks somehow scoring four years, 80 million, even though Houston was bidding against, it seems, no one. There's a lot of money in town now. And so maybe those establishments still have a shot. I don't know either of those guys' proclivities for such activities, but there's at least a lot of money going out on that team right now as the Rockets try and spend around some of the young talent they've got on that team <laughs> and build towards the future. Maybe some of that future still lands near a pole somewhere after hours. Brandon, let's keep it moving with winners. Uh, other winners. People who want to know who shot JFK because Kyrie Irving is coming back <laughs> to Dallas and he is going to have the time. Uh, Kyrie signs a three-year, $126 million deal with the Mavs. The final year of that's a player option, which I think is the concession for Kyrie. Um, 
his maximum set possible salary would have been around $47.6 million. I think this one's going to be about 38.9. So um, this is going to give Dallas a little more wiggle room. And Brandon also kind of shows what we talked about the other day. Kyrie had been working hard to try and get people under the illusion that he had a market out there that it seems didn't exist to the level that he likely would have wanted because we know he was eligible for a longer and larger max extension. This is still a lot of money for a very mercurial player, so there's still some risk built in. But yeah. if you're Kyrie, you feel good that, hey, if you go here and ball with Luka in two years, you've got a chance to get back into the market if you want to opt out and get more money. <laughs> but if you're the Dallas Mavericks, Brandon, we talked about it. This is kind of the thing, the position you painted yourself in. And at the yeah. very least, the solace you can take is reportedly Luka Doncic was in on wanting Kyrie Irving back at the helm. And you've got clear goals if you're Dallas right now, and that's figure out how to maximize Luka Doncic and keep him happy enough to want to stay there for the long term as your real foundational piece for that franchise. And so if Luka really was in on it, then outside of waiting around for whatever weird thing Kyrie's going to say next that bothers the hell out of a lot of people, from a basketball standpoint, you hope that maybe now with some semblance of stability here, even though that's a dangerous word around Kyrie, that maybe you could start to tap into what that combination you thought was capable of that didn't show up in the back half of the season when you initially spliced these two together. Yeah, I mean, you said a lot of great stuff there, but uh, betting on Kyrie's stability is, is one thing yeah. you definitely cannot do. But that's why I laughed when you said he and Luca balling out for two years because that's just... It's very silly. Like right now, I think in this new age of free agency and, and NBA trades and moving things, like this is just him putting a, a, a chess piece down, getting ready for February when he can still end up with the Lakers. Like I think every year Kyrie realizes that he challenges the concept for owners and GMs that he's going to be there consistently. So he takes that first half of the year to prove his worth and in value for whatever it might be. So he can move uh, to, on to another team. It's just like how he got to Dallas last year season, Mike. Like I feel like the, the mobility for the, these guys that are setting the mobility, like Kyrie, who already has a ring, he's just trying shit out. Oh, excuse my language. No, I, that probably makes sense, Brandon. And um, I would say, I think you're right in that trusting Kyrie for stability is probably a fool's errand at this point, And that this person has shown us who he is enough time to where we're just going to wonder, Hey, is Jason Kidd going to survive all this? Like what's that situation going to look like? What are the changes that could potentially be made around there? Will Luka Doncic be able to work his way and carry his way through this? It'd be nice to see Kyrie, the basketball player show up in the ways that he used to. But at this point, we just can't count on all that right now. So the thing that's still hanging in the balance though, Brandon is the notion of LeBron and Luka playing together because remember mm. that report of Kyrie Irving asking and inquiring about LeBron James willingness to come to Dallas and play with him there so that one still technically on the table because Kyrie is still in Dallas so we've got to keep our third eye open on that I'm sure the guys at basketball Illuminati will make sure that we are well aware if and when that becomes something that's potentially real yeah I don't know about that Mike I don't know if you've heard LeBron James and his family is currently living out of a hotel uh, because they demolished their uh, yeah. Brentwood home to make LeBron James' dream home. Uh, I, I don't know if much is going to pull him away from L.A. right now. He's rich enough to afford a couple of dream homes. That's all I'll say is True. he could have a dream home in a, home in a lot of different places. So, uh, But real estate watching and private plane watching are always good ways to try and determine what this news is going to look like. Um, Brandon, uh, one more winner here. Villanova. Big win for them over the weekend, ah. getting to basically have the Villanova Knicks. Um, White Dante, Dante DiVincenzo, <laughs> signed a uh, deal with the Brooklyn, or excuse me, with the uh, New York Knicks over the weekend. Ooh. Four year, $50 million that'll now team him back up with Josh Hart and Jalen Brunson, who were both teammates of his on that 2016 Villanova National Championship team. So if you're a Wildcat fan who is looking and longing for yesteryear when your team was in the mix every year and Jay Wright had you guys rolling, this can be a place where you look fondly now and see this combination of guys. Also, I just love that White Dante, the nickname given to him by Bamani Jones, are now in the same city together in New York. Feel like there needs to be a content collaboration there. Oh, definitely. I, I haven't seen enough of White Dante on the mic, but if he talks anything like he plays, I'm a big fan. Big fan of his content already. I, I love that he is in New York. 
uh, back in the East Coast. Like it's gonna that's gonna be a, a big thing for for the New York Knicks uh, to get another Jay Wright person on that team because Josh Hart really got unlocked with Jalen Brunson last year. I, I'm really glad this wasn't them going after James Harden because them going after James Harden while yeah. he's closer to his prime than most of the people the Knicks usually go after that would have been a very Knicksian move to try and definitely move on someone after the best of their game and likely have to overpay him what you give up in that trade to get them we're still not out of the woods on that the James Harden domino is one of the last left to fall in this yeah. entire offseason equation so we've got that to still wait and worry about but this move and continuing to build around Jalen Brunson who looks right now like one of the best values in the NBA as we see these deals go out and you remember what New York was able to get Jalen Brunson for when Dallas fumbled mm. the bag it's wild what they got in that player especially last season um Brandon I guess one more winner that we should probably uh give some love to this happened really early I think late last week like after the show Friday uh Draymond Green signed his extension uh, extension this actually was late Friday because it was after the match. So Draymond was helping commentate the golf match between Steph Curry and Clay and uh, Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey. And at that point was still a free agent, had not yet signed the deal that he ends up signing, which is four years, a hundred million dollar extension with the hmm. Golden State Warriors. It gives them everything we talked about. This move seemed like a very obvious one on the table, gives him some stability long term, probably the chance to finish out his career as a Golden State Warrior on his terms with everybody, but also lessens his hit each year, gives Golden State some flexibility because they were getting towards some of those cap uh, cap thresholds. And it makes sense for everyone, right? Draymond Green, we have established who he is now, right? Still an integral part of their defense. Yeah. Offensively, far past his best days, a bit of a liability at times there in certain moments in the playoffs, and a guy that you just need to make sure doesn't punch anyone else in the face now because that seems to be the only way he can truly negatively affect this team in a way that's beyond repair. Yeah, I mean, beyond repair is a reach too because they were in the playoffs. <laughs> Even, yeah, I guess even it's with true. that punch. Like, they're a good team. Like, like there, there's something to uh, how special Steph Curry is to get this signing done. Uh, obviously, Draymond Green, his own accolades, Saginaw, Nasty's finest. But, you know, 11 seasons and four championships are directly tied to his relationship with Steph Curry. And for some reason, they it's like a, it's like a, a booster. Like Draymond acts as a booster for Steph Curry's game in a very strange way, and vice versa, because Draymond finally hit 20 points uh, again in this last playoff game. Yeah, maybe we can see another one again, but it's a less about what he does on the court, and I think more of what he does off the court, even if it is punching uh, air apparent uh, Steph Curry's air apparent in Jordan Poole. Bro, I thought, speaking of people that looked like they wanted to punch him in the face, and now, Clay must be very used to this, because Ooh. they've all been a trio for a while, but watching yeah. the match and that golf outing where Draymond was basically the peanut gallery the entire time, and he was chirping and going at Clay, because Clay played rough, he was probably the reason Steph didn't win, and Draymond said, I knew P Clay was going to play bad out here when we were starting today, and he made me look right. And he's saying this close enough to Clay uh, to where he could probably hear it. And yeah. my whole thought process was, and I should have known then, the Draymond deal was probably very close to getting done because that right. man talked like he wasn't afraid of some potential <laughs> free agent joke. Clap back. Uh, Although with Clay, it's not like he's going to be able to say much because after this year, once no. we're through the final year of his deal this year, there's going to be a very serious conversation around his future based on what his production looks like right now and so that should have probably been the sign when no one said anything sideways to Draymond about his contract situation that everyone knew this thing was pretty close to the finish line because he was begging for it there that's got to be really hard even when you're used to it and he's your bleep hole type situation to still have to sit there and eat some of that when things aren't going well the way they clearly weren't when you were clay that day yeah, Clay's not showing up again for Steph. Is is bad for his future uh, uh, with the Warriors, and you know maybe not with their friendship. Maybe they're past that. But I, I mean, I hope Clay bounce back. He does. He's done enough for that program and that franchise to get at least another year. But shout out to Mark J. Spears getting the scoop on Draymond. 
Yeah, big ups. Big ups to Mark J. Spears yeah. on that one. Not to be confused with Marcus Spears, as people often do online here. That's what the J is for, friends. Make it very clear. Um, all right, Brandon, let's get to losers. Um, losers is, is a pretty short list in my mind because, again, most of this we won't know for a while, and it's one of those things where I want everyone to feel like a winner right now, even if your team right. lightly overspent on certain talent, which uh, brings us to two places. One, the losers are people that are less acquainted with the NBA salary cap structure because, man, the terms that get thrown out left and right over the course of free agency in the NBA, Ooh. and now that we've got these new aprons and different hard caps and you've got all the mid-level exemption, arenas, provisions, offer sheets, birds rights, it feels like <laughs> you just keep tacking stuff on to the side of this CBA and how the NBA does business every offseason that gets us to this incredibly confusing point. But Brandon, I guess the big loser would probably be Portland, right? Like you look at yeah. the Trailblazers, the thing finally happened. Now, Portland did make one signing, which might feel a little different now that you've gotten the other news. They signed mm -hmm. Jeremy Grant to five years and $160 million, which shout out to him for going and getting his paper there. Got nothing but love, want to see everybody get paid. But I feel like in light of the news that Damian Lillard has finally requested a trade, that might feel a little bit different if you're Portland now getting ready to walk into the great unknown, depending on what you get back. Because that's going to be it now, Brandon, is Portland, it sounds like, wants a big-time caliber player in return in this deal because they're yeah. faced with the dilemma that a lot of teams that are on the smaller market side find themselves in is – what am I left with when my star finally leaves? We talked about this for years with Oklahoma City when they started off with that group picture that kept getting smaller and smaller every year is who do you let go in for what when you're a team that has had a draw for so long? Damian Lillard has been the guy there and we got the reports coming out from basically everyone that Damian Lillard has requested a trade after 11 seasons with that team. Now, according to Woj and Ramona Shelburne over at ESPN, the Miami Heat, the Los Angeles Clippers, and the Philadelphia 76ers are three teams that have uh, shown interest. But again, according to Anscape's Mark J. Spears, Lillard has said his preference is to be traded to the Miami Heat. So we're also in this weird part now where Brandon, once you make it obvious, the job gets a lot harder for the team that's getting away, ready to trade away the big time asset because you know he where, where he wants to go. We've heard right. all offseason the Miami Heat kind of opted out of the Bradley Beal sweepstakes because they were anticipating being able to go and do their bidding for Damian Lillard. And in a league where star players usually get what they want, especially for Dame Lillard, who does not necessarily control how this goes, but... I would imagine has curried a fair amount of good favor in Portland to where they're probably going to do right by him on the way out as best they can. While not totally shortchanging their future, I would guess Damian Lillard to the Miami Heat seems pretty inevitable at this point. Yeah, and that's scary. That's a scary reality for the East. Um, it seems very odd that they waited this long for on both ends. It seems this long wait that it seems odd that Dame waited this long to request the trade. I don't know if he was waiting for uh, uh, Jeremy Grant to actually be signed. And it was like, they actually signed the guy I asked him to sign. Like, cause he had his big three that he wanted was Jeremy Grant and, and Draymond Green. Maybe Draymond Green getting signed to the Warriors was the final piece of this well, puzzle. But it just feels like everything yeah. was way too late in the game. I think a lot of that was him trying to really earnestly give Portland a chance. And it seems... And I always said this when it comes to like um, in college, when you've got players transferring, everyone's story is different. But I've always said, by and large, transferring is not something you do easily. A lot of times you have relationships there. You've got a life that you've built on campus. You know this as someone who transferred late in our careers. Yeah. My brother did the same thing. You're uprooting a lot to do this. And for Damian Lillard, he's built his adult life in Portland around this team and around this organization. And it seemed like he wanted to give them every chance possible to go out here and do right, whether that was moving the third overall pick in the draft instead of taking Scoot Henderson and trying to turn yeah. that into another veteran player that could win here and now with him he had made it clear by sources we had heard that he didn't want to be part of a youth movement or a rebuild or anything and so it did Brandon seem like he was giving them a chance to go out and do some of the things he wanted go out and try and build this team around him and when that didn't necessarily show up in the ways that he was looking for he finally pulled the ripcord and 
Brandon, my first thought was, I, I hope this isn't too late. Like, I hope this isn't when we got Mayweather Pacquiao and everyone was well past their prime uh, and we missed the boat to make that the yeah. most fun possible. Now, according to ESPN Stats and Info, at least from Dame's side, I don't think that's going to be the case. He is 33 as of July 15th this year. Averaged 32, over 32 points, over 7 assists, but played in just 58 games as he sat out the last month of the season, I'd imagine largely for this reason. Um, but according to ESPN Stats and Info, his points per game would be the most by a player that changed teams the following season in Ooh. NBA history. So Ooh. there's still a lot of that to offer, Brandon. It's just, like you said, very late in the game where normally this would be a domino we'd expect to fall early and then give a team time to com build completely around him. I will say Miami feels inevitable, Brandon, but there is something enticing about the Philadelphia prospect with him, pairing him with Joel Embiid, because we talked about the kind of player that would pair well with Joel Embiid. Imagine being able to stretch and space the floor with a guy that's that much of a perimeter shooting threat and then open yeah. up the lane for a guy in Joel Embiid who's so proficient at both. Plus, mentality-wise, Dame seems like he's going to be a fit anywhere. He's been a guy that's handled his business well. He'll right. do heat culture really well if and when he does end up out there. But there was was something interesting to me about the thought of pairing him with a guy like Joel Embiid in Philadelphia too. The one that, that really sparked my interest was when Dame said he has a lot of respect for these uh, San, Antonio San Antonio Spurs. Spurs. Mike. Yeah. Like that, the, the thought of him and Big Vic teaming up for Vic's first year and Dame's first year out of Portland, uh, there's a lot of purpose there. Obviously, we don't expect the West-to-West -West trade to happen, but I would love to see Damian Lillard play for the San Antonio Spurs. Yeah, that would be another, and again, it, it would fly in the face of what he said about being a part of a youth movement, but I think exactly. there's a youth movement, and I think there's the seven foot three guy who's supposed right. to be the next generational prospect and a coach like Greg Popovich. So seven three, there's seven a lot three of that. seven foot five, by the way. Yeah, in that in that range. I think his official listed height was like seven three and a half. I saw for their roster, but you know, big oh, okay. guys always want to seem a little bit smaller. There's the whole yeah, weird yeah. psychological thing there. Um, but Brandon, I'm with you. Those would be interesting. I still think Miami at the end of the day just seems like it's been talked about too much, bantered about too much in circles that would know something. And I would be stunned if he doesn't end up down there and make Miami an immediate contender now because all the things we said about the fit with him and Joel Embiid, listen, you've got a guy in Bam Adebayo who clearly showed what he is as a center in this league during the course of that final series. Obviously, yep. we know everything about Jimmy Butler, but the consistent outside shooting threat and force that Damian Lillard is on that team would immediately make them a contender and a threat in a very different way in the Eastern Conference. But I think more in line with Boston that's so backcourt dominated as opposed to teams like Milwaukee or Philadelphia that are so shown by their front court and the size that they've got on those teams. So, Brandon, but before we look forward too much, we get to look backward a bit. Obviously, this and James Harden are going to dominate the NBA news cycle for a while now until these get done. But for Dame Lillard, he does have a chance to, I think, strike the perfect balance in when he left and how because he was the guy that stayed for so long. In an era defined by player movement, he gave people that loyalty fix that they wanted for so long. He did right by the Portland Trailblazers organization for such a long time. And now, for anyone that might have had some question about does he have a desire to go and win a championship, is there questions about some of that competitive edge, you get to potentially answer that. You get to potentially add that hardware to a guy who was already part of the NBA's All-75 team when that got voted on last year. And so yeah. Damian Lillard is going to go to a competitor, is going to go to a contender, excuse me, and have a chance to win a title. And Brandon, if he does, he'll have one of those careers where that one ring coupled with what he did in Portland could end up being like, not quite as much as the LeBron James Cleveland ring if he had actually gotten and delivered one in Portland, but for Dane's personal legacy, could really bump him up into another stratosphere that he may not have unlocked in Portland. We act like that the the realm of legacy basketball players like the Ray Allen tier doesn't exist. You know what I mean? Like that that championship where you make a big play, like he's not going to be on that team and not be pivotal pivotal to any championship that comes afterwards. Yeah, this feels like his version of the Ray Allen, that big three Celtics team where they all came together ah. after these stellar careers and were able to then cement it with that last all important piece.
All right, Brandon, uh, before we bring this thing on home and finish up the show with this, that, and the third, three quick stories, send everybody off into their day with, did want to take a minute and just wish well. Uh, a lot of my former colleagues over at ESPN, everyone saw over the weekend, it was a, a tough situation with another round of layoffs hitting there, and they had had layoffs affect people behind the camera. These were uh, you know, a bunch of the prominent talent on camera that people had known, but just another in a series of tough days. Like I, I got to ESPN in 2015, and before that in my adult lifetime watching when my dad had been there there had never been layoffs that place was recession proof as most of the sports industry was and it's just not been the case I've seen a bunch of rounds of layoffs when I was there and it's always difficult seeing a ton of people you love and respect seeing people that you know I was close friends with I mean Jason Fitz who was a part of that was a guy that you know was like a, a work brother to me over there. The amount of stuff that we worked on together, Jordan Cornette, who was kind enough to just come out to our golf tournament and has been a great friend of this show and is an unbelievable uh, professional on and on down the list. There's just a lot of great people who got dealt a really tough hand this weekend. And I know it can get pretty ugly on the internet because that's just how things work. But uh, I think in general, a lot of us looked with sadness on a lot of the people that have been a part of our sports lifetime. Susie Colber, who I don't know sports yeah. television without, was one of the first people my dad worked with at ESPN when he started coming on there as a player and towards the end of his career. Just legends and titans in the industry that are now no longer a part of those broadcasts at the at the four letters. And so I just wanted to send my well wishes to everyone that's still there that's dealing with all that, to all my, you know, friends and coworkers and people that I've looked up to and uh, respected who, uh, uh, you know, had to deal with what was a really, really hard weekend, uh, I'd imagine, you know, thinking about them, loved all them, and certainly respect for all the great work, appreciative of all the great work and great teammates that so many of them were. So uh, just, you know, didn't want that to go unsaid after this weekend, man. It's And it's been going on industry-wide right now. It's a really precarious time around sports media, and so... Uh, you know, it, it certainly makes us thankful to to have the situation that we have here and certainly appreciative of that. But, uh, you know, I know all those people will land on their feet, too. It's so many incredibly talented people who make incredible yeah. things for all of us to watch, read, listen and consume. And we'll be doing it again somewhere else in short order that I have no doubt. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, from Jeff Van Gundy to Jalen Rose, Keyshawn Johnson, like there's this you remember uh, in times like this, unfortunately, when it's hard times, just how much of a community, fraternity, sorority that sports media is and has become. Uh, these are family members. You know, we go through real life things together. Obviously, we talked about off the top of the show. Uh, so it, it's just it's just deeper than it's deeper than a paycheck. And um, we wish everyone will. Absolutely. So, uh, no, no easy transitions, Brandon, like we always say, but we'll get to this, that, and the third. Yep. Now we'll finish out the show here the way that we always do and get everyone on to celebrate their holiday, uh, this week. And Brandon, why don't we start this? We haven't done Monday roses in a while, so we figure we might as well hand a couple of these out. I know you're very excited for one team that we didn't get to in the free agency discussion. So go ahead and give your rose about Brandon. I think I know where this is going. Uh my rose goes to Jeannie Buss and the rest of them over there. Rob Palenka, you know, uh, Rob Lowe's lookalike. Um, the Los Angeles Lakers, Mike, are finally making moves that make sense for their franchise and the team that they currently have instructed. Obviously, going to the playoffs uh, last year and making a little run uh, obviously makes it so you can really fill out and see what your team is and what it needs and what it doesn't need. But to jump straight to the, the money, Mike, the Lakers made some good signings. Austin Reeves, the white chocolate, uh, white heat, four years, $56 million, max extension for the Los Angeles Lakers. Rui Achimara, Mora, I'm sorry if I just said your name wrong, my Japanese king. Three years, $51 million deal. Gabe Vincent, three years, $33 million. Cam Reddish, the guy from Duke who needs to get it uh, settled out. Two years, 4.6, minimal contract, who's going to do wonders for himself in his time with the Lakers. And then... D'Angelo Russell. Obviously, I don't love that we got rid of Dennis Schroeder, but if you can't have Dennis Schroeder and D'Angelo Russell, D'Angelo Russell, two years, $37 million back to the team that's uh, drafted him originally at Ohio State from Louisville, Kentucky. I like everything that's going on with the Lakers. It makes sense to the current roster. 
I was wondering where the the fascination with D'Angelo Russell was going to come from, and then I remembered the Louisville, Kentucky. <laughs> For anyone unfamiliar, if the person went to Louisville, Kentucky, or at all is associated with traffic around Los Angeles or anything there, Brandon is going to be sure to remind you uh, what it's what time it is. And Brandon, it was nice to see them keep the band together. Now, I, it doesn't sound like the Lakers are necessarily – precluded from making another big move in the future here, but this is a right. core that worked around LeBron James and Anthony Davis, and we know at the end of the day, this team is going to be about what Anthony Davis is able to f continue to find with his ceiling and how often LeBron stays healthy, but the rest of these guys prove themselves really well. Pumped for Austin Reeves to be out there in Los Angeles to keep talking his you-know-what, man. That is a net win for all of us. So, yes, congratulations to your Los Angeles Lakers for getting to do the damn thing. Brandon Myrose is going to go to the Mountain West Conference for knowing their worth and holding nice. strong. Because you remember a while back, San Diego State was apparently attempting to leave the Mountain West Conference. They said that they were exploring all options and asking questions. They asked the Mountain West for a month-long extension to basically see if they could figure out a deal with the Pac-12. They asked to date while still living with the Mountain West. And the Mountain West said, <laughs> absolutely not. No chance in hell. And so San Diego State had to admit, all right, nothing was going on out here. We're just going to slink back and come to the Mountain West. So shout oh, out man. to one of the power, the group of five conferences, knowing your worth, holding steady, and knowing that eventually when they were done with all that messing around, they were going to come on back home to the real thing. Very, very happy for the Mountain West. Um, Brandon, let's get to that. This one just selfish for me, man. Beat my chest yelling USA. Team USA in the World Lacrosse uh, Championships beat Canada in the final over the weekend here. They got a 10-7 win over Canada. And, man, oh, man, I can say this now happily because Notre Dame managed to beat Duke in the national championship, finally slay that dragon. Brennan O'Neill, who won the Tawaritan Award in College Lacrosse, which is the Heisman Trophy of College Lacrosse this year, yep. is 21 years old, was the only collegiate player on Team USA's roster for these World Games, Wow. Scored five goals in the championship game and might already be the best player in the world. Brandon, this man is a physical freak show. He is silky smooth. He is insanely powerful. And so many of these goals were him just putting his head down. And you were hearing stories from teammates on the team, older guys that are saying, dude, you've got the juice. Just go and do the things that coaches tell you you're not supposed to. And when we saw him unburdened by any of that thought process, the result was insane. And it's always great beating America's hat. So shout out to Team USA Lacrosse for getting this done here. Great showing in the World Games. Fingers crossed now the next goal in the big stage for lacrosse is to hopefully get it named as an Olympic sport by the time we get to the Olympic Games in Ooh. Los Angeles in 2028. It sounds like that decision's coming up sometime this July. That'll be exciting, Mike. An another way for us to show our dominance. And shout out to that young man. It reminds me of a, a Christian Leitner in the, uh, the Dream Team. <laughs> a very hateable Duke stars. Brandon, <laughs> let's get to the third. Um, this one uh, I saw the other day, and I wanted to get your opinion on if you think we'd be suited for this. So starting last <laughs> night, Sunday night, a team of four volunteers is planning to spend the next year inside of a 1,700 square foot 3D printed habitat of the Johnson Space Center. They're simulating what it would be like to live on Mars... And we'll be conducting a number of experiments in this about what communication would look like, what it would be problem solving if you were on that planet, basically trying to simulate the circumstances that would happen on the red planet if we were to go and be able to send people there like we did with Ben, uh, with Matt Damon. So what would you say if we took me, you and my dad and locked us in a 1700 square foot 3D printed room for the next year? Ah, <sighs> you know what, Mike, I, I've, my gut reaction says absolutely I do it. I love a nice diet. Uh, any any new diet uh, I would love to try out. Also, when I think about my children just miss me for one year, could be kind of cool. You know, dad's in space. <laughs> you know, dad dad dad's an astronaut, comes back as a hero. But I, I, I couldn't do it because of my kids. I would love to produce it uh, remotely, though. I realized I've already done this. I did a 28-hour fantasy football marathon with me and Stu Gotts locked in Studio Z at ESPN, <laughs> unable to leave for the entirety of it. And let me tell you, spending time with you guys after being locked in a room with Stu Gotts would be a welcome respite. I did not know someone could smoke that many heaters indoors in a sealed room. Um, Brandon, we hope you guys enjoyed being locked in the 1,700-square-foot room with us. If you did, make sure you download, subscribe, rate, review. Check us out on YouTube, and we will talk to you tomorrow. Boom.
Boom. Money in the bank.